to legally speaking with me Tarun Nangia. In a large economy like ours, judgments and orders given by the court can have an impact of billions of dollars and on millions of individuals and livelihoods in the country. Hence, it has become important for us to take up the issue of the economic impact of court judgments. And to discuss this issue, I have with me uh, in the studio to my right, uh, Justice Arjun Kumar Sikri and uh, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi. To my left uh, is Senior Advocate Pinky Anand and uh, Justice M.M. Kumar. I welcome them to the program today. Let's begin our discussion on the economic impact of court judgments. Uh, uh, sir, your opening comment uh, on this very important issue. Okay, let me just introduce the concept of uh, law and economics. When we talk of law and economics, it is the economic aspects of law in a loose sense, one can say so. But uh, it has been described as economic analysis of law as well, that how we interpret the law in economic terms. And uh, in that sense, if I may say, it is regarded as, on jurisprudential basis, as the mechanism for promoting economic efficiency. Okay. So therefore, the approach has to be such which promotes economic of efficiency. And uh, uh, of course, uh, if I tell you, uh, way back in 1980s, uh, in America, this concept was developed and uh, the lead person at that time, and who has written quite a few books also, is uh, Justice Postner. Judge Postner, who was the judge of the Court of Appeal there for almost, I think, 35, 37 years, and uh, he uh, demitted office few years ago, has even written books on that. And uh, he was the main proponent uh, of uh, uh, this aspect. But if I tell you, uh, I, I'm not going into the jurisprudence of uh, uh, the law and economics because uh, that would be a highly intellectual kind of uh, thing. and. Uh, uh, but then uh, theory of law and economics, we can, if I may say uh, in nutshell, in so many aspects of daily, uh, uh, when the judiciary or the judges are dealing with all kinds of cases. I give you the example of traffic violation. Now traffic violation, if somebody violates the traffic, he is fine for that, right? So the question, it is not only that uh, finding a person for traffic violation, the economic analysis in that sense takes care of the conduct of those persons also. Okay. That yes, the conduct would be the person would be deterred from uh, 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 violating it again. So that is behind that. Take tort law, damages for somebody <coughs> has committed a civil wrong and uh, uh, we talk of providing damages. So the person who is a wrongdoer is to pay damages. There's a way it has to be calculated, damages, etc., are to be done. That is one aspect. But the when we talk of economic analysis, it does not look at the concept of damages solely as a compensation, if I may say so, to the injured person, but it provides an incentive for penalties, uh, for potential injuries to take uh, efficient and justified precaution to avoid causing such accidents. Okay. I take your point. Uh, I'll go to Dr. Singhvi at this moment. Sir, you have appeared in cases uh, which have had an impact or large impact on the economy and livelihoods of people and you've appeared in many such cases which have had such impact. Do you think economic consideration should figure in court judgments or they should only go strictly by law or also the economic angle should be considered by the court of law? Well, I think the answer to that is an absolute Yes, it's a vital factor which you can ignore only at your own peril. And I'm sure we'll discuss individual cases, yes. many of which have appeared in AGR or the liquor, yes, distance matter, etc., etc. But just a few general points about the construct, the conceptual construct or the vehicle in which these judgments arise, which themselves are, in a sense, limited by shortcomings. Okay. It's not even the judge's fault, it's not an individual's fault, it's an institutional system. One, 90% of them arise in PIL construct. Now, PIL is a strange vehicle where frequently the person, one person is the respondent, who after the PIL proceedings becomes remediless. Okay. The company is a respondent. Yes. Once the PIL court is passing mandamuses every day over a period of two years, his remedies become non-existent, which may be otherwise in criminal law, tort law, civil law, suit writ. Second, 
the courts necessarily are more bilateral, trilateral, or at the most quadrilateral in their focus. Yes. They can't be holistic because ultimately they have a list. So the focus is very, very frequently binary, but I'm giving the benefit of quadrilateral. Yes. So the focus is limited. It cannot be holistic, whereas, whereas such matters necessarily require a holistic perspective. Third, courts are designed to say black and white, binary yeses and nos. Strike down, mostly negative power they have. They don't have a power to create in place of what they strike down. So the court frequently creates bona fide a vacuum, yes. which it can't fill up. And the government takes long to fill up. And that's where the entire economy suffers. Fifth, uh, there is a uh, multiplier effect, which the courts just cannot gauge. In any proceeding, they can see between me and him, they can see the third or fourth party. But they cannot see from the fifth to the millionth party, yes. the multiplier effect, not only in jobs, but in so many ways, a multiplier effect of a decision on the economic structure. Yes. And sixth is the fact that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the whole system doesn't have inbuilt institutionally a post-judgment audit system. Yes. You know, bona fide, he may strike down or direct something. After one year, two years or three years, there should be a report submitted back to the judiciary that now everything is silent, things have settled down, this man has won, I have lost. But what is the economic impact of that judgment after three years, five years, and ten years? So, and if this, that report came back to the judiciary, there would be a tremendous inbuilt corrective mechanism for future cases. Very now, all of these things combine to make judicial decision making on highly sensitive economic, antitrust, uh, matters like that, necessarily imperfect. Even if you want to be good, it's going to be difficult. Yes. So the approach has to be very cautious, very caveated, and very non-interfering, except as a last resort. Very fair, very good points made by Dr. Singhi, but uh, because he spoke particularly about the fifth or sixth dimension of the impact on the economy that maybe uh, the court uh, wouldn't find out. I'll, I have an example, when there was a liquor ban judgment where uh, you know liquor sales were disallowed within 500 meters of the highways, uh, a lot of lawmakers or people, elected representatives came up with this feedback that highways in India earlier were say out of town, but due to actual bad planning in India, these highways are now passing through the heart of the cities or they have now in the center of the towns, thereby making it very difficult to implement such a judgment, but that is just one opinion. I will go to Ma'am Pinky Anand at this moment and would you agree to what Dr. Singhvi says? I have some reservations Okay, and I will tell you why. I mean basically the kind of jurisprudence that we have adapted ourselves to. I think there is too much stepping out and somewhere down the line you need to focus and I say so for two reasons. You basically have individual litigation, so far so good. Individual litigation in its own way is fairly easy to cover and yes there if you want to see the economic impact that's one aspect of it. But the danger zone comes in these PIL okay. nature of litigations and I think there what is happening is the desire to look at every aspect and to, in a manner, give judgments to suit that purpose. For example, take the liquor, liquor case. The issue was drunken driving, the issue was accidents. Yes. We step up, in fact, it wasn't liquor, it was drunken driving. Yes. But directly or indirectly, it came into liquor business. And of course, the impact which it made, and as you possibly know, about 70% highways have stopped being highways. Yes. Because the judgment itself gave that caveat that you can actually, yes. the state can uh, exempt declare. from, or declare rather, you're right, to, uh, these highways not to be so, and therefore not uh, bound by the judgment. But as I said, I feel that the traditional method possibly has some more to say for itself. The rule of law, to keep to that, and not to extend it beyond it. Okay. Ultimately, a judge or the courts or the system of rule of law demands that you decide the court the matter according to the perception of law and its impact if any whether social whether cultural whether political whether economic possibly is something that shouldn't be looked at because otherwise there would be too much discretion which would be in. okay and i think it's an area which really leaves uh, it not open to the court to have the expertise also. I mean, I, there are times and times you don't have that expertise yes. and to go into that domain would widen the circle. If I may add to that only, what you have said is not contrary to what mm. the yes. Actually, Dr. Singh has Supporting said. me while denying yes. it. In a way, supporting <laughs> while. Actually, the, the, Possibly. Where I but wanted I to come, yes. view of the when same. I was uh, speaking in the beginning, that uh, of course that was the e law and economics when you talk of it jurisprudentially, etc. But then the thrust is, which is rightly pointed out by both the persons, that when judge who is dealing with the case 
decides or particular bench decides a case, it may be that on the application of law you are deciding yes. a particular case. Yes. It may be that on the basis of that, legally speaking, yes. on the basis of legal norms, you think that the judgment is, what judgment is to be given is correct. Yes. But at the end of the day, the outcome yes. when it comes to that, and I'll give you the example, maybe you may go into that in greater detail, like suppose 2G case or coal cases. Now these were the cases again out of PIL. Yes. And now PILs are filed, whether the allotment of the spectrum in 2G or the coal mining leases which were given were uh, correct, right or not. Yes. So from administrative law point of view, this is discussed. Yes. And it was found that there were flaws yes. in that. Now I'm presuming that on that the judges were right okay. and they rightly said that it is what is done is wrong. But when it comes to economic analysis and the economic impact which both uh, Pinky and uh, Dr. Singhvi they have highlighted, there while and in any case when we are in the Supreme Court particularly and Article 142 is there, yes. substantive justice. So whether in both the cases the outcome whether it was necessary after holding it to be bad to quash everything yes. or they could have found some other way like uh, only let these license remain because let us not upset the apple cart at after such uh, so many years and what will be the impact of that if that happens that is what is not looked into by the judges at that time they go by letter of law and simply quash. That's a very important point, going by letter of law and then quashing. At this point, I'll go to Justice M.M. Kumar. Sir, you've dealt extensively with the kind of cases which impacts, in fact, lakhs of people working in companies in your uh, previous position in the NCLT, which you were head chairing. Uh, could you share your opinion on this whole issue? Well, I would say NCL insolvency and bankruptcy code stand on a different platform like Dr. Singhvi mentioned about PIL, uh, Insolvency Bankruptcy Code has been designed in a manner so that the old regime of borrower controlling the assets of a company is replaced by the creditor controlling the assets of the company. The results are phenomenal. Earlier, the recovery used to be 26 percent and the approximate time taken to decide a case used to be about five years. But now, the approximate time is one and a half year and recovery is 43 percent for financial creditors, 46 percent for operational creditors. Okay. So this is, the impact is so much that something like five and half lakh crore, five and half trillion rupees have been recovered so far. The resolution has been there. 2100 cases were filed. Okay. 1000 uh, cases have been settled. 850 cases uh, which were uh, uh, settled were before the admission. Yes. 150 cases it settled after admission. Okay. So this is the type of uh, uh, phenomena we are passing through because IBC has brought uh, an end to, may not an end, but it has considerably reduced the uh, non-performing assets, which you see, which was in the range of 11 lakh crore. Now it is something like, uh, Five lakh So, sir, since you were the first person to head this uh, uh, NCLT, I would want to know from you, was there any response from the government with the kind of contribution NCLT has made with regards to the economy of the country and before and after? Was, was there any response from the government at any point of time? Well, I can recall one instance when the former finance minister mentioned after the Bhushan Steel Resolution Plan was approved. That's Mr. Arun Jaitley? Uh, Mr. Jaitley. Yes. Uh, he mentioned in a uh, social gathering that uh, the rupee value against a dollar yes. has gone up by about one and a half rupees. After the judgment. After the reason given was that the money was coming from Germany, UK, 
USA, etc. Et yes, yes. So that was the type of impact yes. uh, of court judgment yes. directly on the economy. We had Justice M.M. Kumar sharing with us the kind of contributions that NCLT has made uh, and what was in the economic impact. And he also mentioned to us a comment which was made by former finance minister Arun Jaitley where he said uh, how the rupee uh, dollar variation happened after the judgment as you said. And uh, just as I was speaking, uh, Justice Sikri had to make a point. So yes. we'll come back to no, you. Uh, Justice Kumar has, uh, has stated about the impact of economic impact of IBC yes. and the way it has worked. I would like to give a different nuance, of course. I agree with what he has said. Yes. And in that sense, okay, economic impact and the lots of NPAs uh, which were of such a magnitude have come down yes. is one aspect. But when we talk of economic uh, impact of a particular decision which is to be taken by the court and here NCLT. Now here, another nuance is this. Here is a company which maybe NPA here and the say bank has filed or some other creditor has filed the petition. Now for the question is at that stage it is to be seen yes some other creditors now as he rightly said that the thirst of the new act is that it should be creditor in possession rather than debtor mm -hmm. the earlier board which remains in possession and they will fritter away the assets etc. Yes, yes. And now so they, they can be substituted by a new management which may take an insolvency pr uh, professional would uh, come in between and uh, he would uh, try to work out whether the company can be saved and can be uh, turned around or not. Now on that aspect, now here before the NCLT court there may be a situation where when the resolution process or the scheme is brought about. When we talk of uh, the economic impact, the question is at that stage, should we allow this company to go bankrupt? Yes. Or should we uh, 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 ensure that the company is saved? It may go to some other hand. It may be that's a different thing. The management may be transferred. But the choice between liquidation, liquidation and Yes, liquidation and that. So that if the company is, say, in some industrial production, that goes on. The workers who are working, Yes. They're, so they're, 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 they're employment, they, they are not rendered unemployed, yes. that is another thing and at the same time the creditors, their interest is also safeguarded. Yes. So therefore here would be one approach of the court when it goes into the economic analysis. That is another facet of uh, good looking point. at Dr. Singh, we want to okay, Let me uh, give you a concrete example, uh, starting with mainly the NCLT and one non-NCLT example. Now, NCLT is a great success, there's no doubt a law like this was needed. It changed the burden of proof yes. from creditors running after borrowers to vice versa. And he's absolutely right, the figures are, they can be improved, but they are good to start with, 26 to 46, etc. Now, two or three aspects. First of all, the dirty dozen were the ones which led to this. These two of them in which I appeared, the Bhushan and the Arsalor Mittal, yes. were the good stories. The success stories. Success stories. The yes. earliest of the dirty dozen. Yes. A lot of other dirty dozen are still lying. Yes. But they went all the way up to the Supreme Court in within one and a half years. And we had Arsalo Mittal 1 and Arsalo Mittal 2. Yes. 2 was equally torturous because after having won 1, I was for Arsalo Mittal, to implement it was not easy because there was a second guard action. So there are no doubt success stories. But let me, since the theme of today is economic impact of judgments, let me give you in the NCLT field uh, a negative uh, impact because courts did not see the holistic view. A third case in which I happened to appear was where IDBI was a creditor. I was for IDBI. The respondent party was the uh, 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 JP. Now, the matter went on for one and a half years in the Supreme Court in court number one. And in the first six months, it was a normal insolvency, seeing the act, seeing whether it could. Into that matter, parachuted a bunch of home buyers. And everybody is very sympathetic to home buyers. They are victims, they need remedies. Question is, is this the right remedy? The next one year was spent in trying to intermesh IBC and that was pre-amendment. There was no amendment at that time to the IBC yeah, was, and so the home buyers. Now, it is and not triggered, sir, you are using a mild word. It was virtually a de facto mandamus by that court, court yes. which led to an amendment. Yeah, yeah. I believe, and I am quite open in saying so, that that was like putting a square hole in a round peg or putting a round peg in a square hole. Because the IBC Act was kept, was kept the same and a deeming fiction was passed that home buyer shall be deemed to be part of a section called 58G, 58F. The result is 
then we had a second matter, Pioneer, in which we appeared in the Supreme Court, which has clarified that little bit. But the result is, inherently, the structure of IBC is not designed for home bias. As a judge who has dealt with it, no. So you have a single, I'll give you a stark example and finish, a single big builder who may have a single company but 10 projects. Yes. Each project is 100, so 10 is 1,000 buyers. Yes. But the company is one. In, ten, in 1,000, I actually had a matter like that. Only about five dissatisfied home buyers. Only five dissatisfied. Now, the IBC is a proceeding in REM. One of them goes to IBC. The entire builder's company goes in uh, bankruptcy. Now, it was never designed. The Supreme Court, which passed that judgment, uh, creating an amendment, was never designed to see these things. And according to me, and now they've had a second amendment to IBC, to correct some of the great problems of, of the home buyers. They've just recently had an amendment that one person just can't treat it out like that, etc. I am sure there are more amendments in the offing. Yes. What is happening is, this is patchwork. It is knee-jerk reaction knee -jerk. to a problem. I find that he's suffering, do something for him. Yes. I find that she's suffering, do something for her. But that becomes, the act becomes like a patchy patient with bandages all over. So that's the problem. One very quickly before I finish, the, the liquor thing is a very interesting thing. Yes. We appeared in that, and as she rightly said, it started with accidents. But you know, to a funny part and a serious part of it, there is a study I just found while coming here, Cuts. It's a famous consumer organization. They published a study saying that one case cost 10 to 15,000 crores. This is a statistical study. One case. Cost, in terms of economic cost, 10 to 15,000 crores and 1 lakh jobs. One lakh jobs. But what is more interesting is the Niti Aayog study, which says that from April to September 2017, and this is the Niti Aayog, it is for 6 months, 2017, 496 crores and, uh, uh, were lost for every 1,000 kilometer of highway. Okay. Statistical study. Now, the Supreme Court never thought of it. And here's the comic footnote as I end. The comic footnote is that when the Supreme Court said 500 meters from the highway, yeah. of course, one thing they forgot was that Delhi, India now is no more urban rural. Yes. There's a third category called rurban. Neither rural nor urban. Both rural and urban. Yes. So, rurban. Second is very funny. Immediately after three months, when these people, restaurants were desolate, bars were desolate, everything losing jobs. What they did was, they made a road from the highway, which went like this. Zigzag. Yes. Zigzag. Just so that it For exactly 600 meters. Yes. The same distance. Yes. And the argument which we were asked to advance at the court, ultimately there was some modification of the order, was so funny and comic, if it were not tragic <laughs> for these people. So this is what people, the courts cannot possibly gauge and should not enter into this kind of thing. You see, that if I may add to that, actually what happens in such cases, in the court's approach, of course, here, what I said, okay, maybe at the back of the mind, it was, as she rightly said, accidents. A person under the influence of liquor, if he is driving, yes. he would cause accident and there would be deaths on road. And uh, therefore, though so many people are dying, it becomes a human rights issue, right? So why people should be allowed to die? And if the people are dying, then, as against that, even if there's a loss of uh, business, there's a loss of uh, revenue, there's a loss of employment, as against the, uh, I mean, we have to protect the human lives which are more precious. Yes. It looks fine. Yes. But only question is, here, did the court go into the issue, how many deaths are caused only because people were driving, or there are other reasons also? Marginal there's, there, there's no scientific re no uh, study. So therefore, unless there is a scientific study, when you come to that uh, another example which I had given yes. was of uh, uh, they say, the, in, uh, crackers during crackers Diwali. Ran, yes. So there, of course, that was my order. Yes. And uh, uh, here, I, I, where I uh, said that, look, uh, the earlier, if you remember, Justice Kuldeep Singh, way back in 90s, uh, H schedule H industry, which was more hazardous industry, was driven out of Delhi, yes. which was much more necessary because it was causing so much of pollution. pollution. So it was affecting uh, everybody in the city. And But in that case, if you read in my order, which I have said, that look, human right angle is also there. Yes. But I am not going into detail of this for want of statistics. Okay. So therefore, what I am trying to say is that the court, even if they one has to strike a balance. Yes. When it is human lives are on the one side and economy is on the other side, there is no doubt about it. But then, without any scientific studies, the court should not only on uh, general notions that this may be happening. So here, general notion was no accidents take place, 
because people, uh, uh, I mean, when they, uh, there's a drunken driving, accidents would take place. But suppose 10,000 accidents in a year, yes. whether out of these 10,000 accidents, it is only 5, 10 or 20 or 100 yes. or 1,000, which was because of these, and 9,000 was because of other reasons. Faulty roads. And, 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 and there was no such studies. And in the absence of that, the, uh, going to the extent of uh, then banning it over, over 500 meters, uh, and in the process while fixing that 500 meters also so many other aspects which uh, Dr. Singhvi has highlighted were not gone into. Yes. I, I so, want to add a caveat yes. here. On the firecrackers, uh, Dr. Sikri, I must say there's two things that we, I was appearing at that time for the government also. And one of the real issues that we had tried to agitate before you was the 800 odd families which were engaged in Sivakasi, uh, which are in fact only dealing with this business of preparation yes. of firecrackers and the timing of the order. Now, these were two issues that we had tried to pinpoint to say, assuming everything good about the judgment and everything good about the order, the question whether such an order could be passed, it was just pre-Diwali. Assuming at that point of time and also the contradiction of some of the reports, there wasn't very, very clear evidence that firecrackers themselves were the most important cause of pollution or high. I'm not saying it's not there, but I'm saying while it is there, there are other various other factors which went into it. So there was this entire debate and it's actually something which has to be considered. No, no, here, here I am not to, uh, here, uh, to defend the judgment. No, no, I'm, I'm not attacking it either. I, I, I may, I'm I, not attacking it either. I may only give two <coughs> answers to this if, uh, and that's a part of record. It's not that the judgment came just before. Yes, orders came before the yes, yes. It started seven, eight months ago. Yes. If you see the record, we wanted government to take action. And ultimately, another thing which is very, very important, Mr. Nath Karni, ASG, he was appearing. Yes. It was a statement of the government on the basis of which order is passed. Okay. I took that care. Okay. It's the government's policy which was placed on record. Yes. And uh, we had been asking them to con uh, have the study conducted, etc., from Niri and other places. Yes. And it is the government which came out with this that there should be only green crackers yes. and not other crackers. And we are for green crackers, and there is a technology available for that. So the court's and decision yes, was based on that. This plus other second factor, the statistics or the studies which were shown yes. were that if the, the, the uh, I mean the. Uh, a uh, person who gets affected yes. or the people who get affected because of this smoke of yes. these crackers, yes. this is irreversible. Yes. Yes. I, I must yes. say one thing which is why I would support a judgment like this. There were two unique features which I have missed. We have to talk principle. It's not individual cases only. Yes. Two unique features about this case in the context of economic impact of judgments and PILs. It's PIL, this matter as well. A, they had a lot of backbone of what is called a Brandeis brief in US material studies, All that was 90 percent of these cases do not have it. The judge bona fide applies the law, yes. he's in the purity of the law, he says legal principle is upheld, he has no factual basis. They had those studies. The second is even more important. This judgment struck down something which they felt in their wisdom was bad, but it also created an alternative. 90 percent of the other cases don't create an alternative. So they said, right, we won't have traditional uh, 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 crackers, but the whole population of India can't be without crackers. So let's try and push. So it is like pushing diesel to petrol. I'm giving an example. It's not the same example. Or it's pushing, let's say, diesel and petrol to green fuel. Or CNG. So you are creating a alternative which you are pushing to do something. So you have something in place. Frequently, these judgments create a vacuum yes. from which arises chaos. No, but I'll just add on the last part. The timing, however, didn't tally with this. The alternative was for future, not for that time. Okay. I'll leave it at that. But we are out of time at this point. So uh, uh, we end part one of the economic impact of court judgments. I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Singhvi, uh, Justice Sikri, uh, Ma'am Pinky Anand, and Justice M.M. Kumar for sparing their time and joining us on part one of the economic impact of court judgments on legally speaking. We will be back with part two soon. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.